Welcome to Bitcoin Stuff. My advice to you is you should think of the Bitcoin world as being kind of like going into Narnia. So in the Narnia books, the main characters are normal children outside. Then they go through the magic wardrobe and then they're in Narnia and they meet all kinds of strange creatures. Uh, in Narnia, they have everything. It's like a fan fiction universe. You know, so they've got, uh, they've got talking animals, they've got mythological creatures, they've got satyrs, they've got dryads, they've got centaurs, they've got, uh, undead beings, they have Santa Claus, and they have Jesus. Just throw everything in there. That was C.S. Lewis's strategy, and that is, uh, a lot like Bitcoin, because you get into Bitcoin, who do you meet? You meet weirdos, you meet crazy people. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of a crazy place, right? So I think that if you imagine the people in Bitcoin as if they are monsters in Narnia, that will help you stay grounded, okay? That will help keep you away from the crazy emotions that uh, fill up all of Bitcoin. And uh, in, in the Narnia books, um, the children... Uh, are, you know, they are normal children outside, but when they go in, they are kings of Narnia. So they have, they have special abilities when they go in. But you can forget that you are a king of Narnia, because Narnia is a treacherous place that will, uh, will try to trick you. Okay, so if you forget, that you're a king of Narnia, then you lose your powers. So you should think of, um, you, you go through the wardrobe into Bitcoin and you're a normal child and you don't want to forget that you're a king of Narnia. Because if you do, then you become one of the monsters. Okay? So, so I, I want to specifically discuss Narnia because, uh, Narnia is, uh, a creepy place, you know, as I mentioned. So by contrast, let's say you were telling me that I could go to Middle Earth. Well, obviously I would be in. I would be in immediately, you know. I would say, how do we get there? Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. What's taking so long? And you say like, uh, well, you know, there's kind of a Dark Lord in there. Dark Lord? Are you kidding me? No way. You're telling me that there is an actual Dark Lord in there? Come on, what is the catch? Because I'm like, you know, Dark Lord, whatever. Dark Lord, come on. You know, I, I, they don't have science in there. Okay, Middle Earth doesn't have science. I know experimental physics. I know statistical models. Whatever, you know, I get my own magic. So I think I would be fine. I'd figure out how it works. I would get my own magic. Then maybe I could be the Dark Lord. You see, if he can be the Dark Lord, why shouldn't I be the Dark Lord? You know, that's what I think about Middle Earth. And if I went into Middle Earth, I, I don't know, I, I probably would never want to come back. Because when I read Lord of the Rings, I'm always thinking, like, why don't I know what's on the next page yet? But uh, when I read Narnia books, Narnia books are disturbing. Okay, they are scary. They are, they are creepy. And sometimes I want to put the book down. Okay, and I want to say, uh, ho, ho, ho. I am glad to be back out of your mind and into the real world, C.S. Lewis. Uh, and that is totally just like Bitcoin, isn't it? Um, you want to, uh, you want to go in and out. Okay. You want to have friends on the outside. Okay. Cause then you can stay connected to reality. Okay. If you don't stay connected to reality when you're in Bitcoin, then uh, you forget that you are a king of Narnia. And you don't want that. One of the first things that happens in book one of the Narnia series is that an idiot boy named uh, Peter, I think, comes into Narnia and he doesn't know the rules. So he doesn't know that he is a king of Narnia. And the first thing that he meets upon entering Narnia is the evil queen, who is an imposter, uh, an, an imposter ruler. You know, and uh, by coincidence, she just happens to be right there, and uh, she wants to know about him. And she realizes that he is a king of Narnia, 
and she tries to make him uh, forget. She tries to distract him. So she offers him some magic Turkish delight, which makes him uh, him forget, makes him her mind control slave. And uh, there is a BBC version of the Narnia series that I like quite a bit, even though it's uh, pretty pretty boring. Uh, you know, they they did what they could with with what they had. You know, the special effects aren't great, but I really like the actress who plays the evil queen because it is like so ridiculously over the top. It is like a. If you brought them to me, I should give you more Turkish delight. Oh, give it to me now! But I can't. The magic will work only once. It would be another matter if you were in my house, my magic house. Kid, how how can you fall for that? I mean, you see nothing suspicious there, okay? And I I had never met somebody like the evil queen before I got into Bitcoin, okay? But once I got into Bitcoin, uh, lots of people are like the evil queen. So here's a here's a quick example. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Ru Ruja something blah blah blah. Okay, she invented the uh, one coin to uh, to scam people. Look at her, look at her. On the one hand, it's like uh, you know it is terrible what these people are doing, but on the other, how how do you get into this auditorium and think? Um, yeah, that looks legit. They got fireworks. You know, they've got the Eye of Sauron. They've got a guru lady babbling nonsense. This network was created to become and to fuel the growth of OneCoin, which I strongly believe will be the number one cryptocurrency worldwide. And the reason why I believe it is because I see all of you here. One coin is easy to use. One coin is for everyone. Make payments everywhere, everyone, globally. And this is who we are, global citizens of a small world wanting to make a change. Um, yeah, I'm, that's, that is definitely what I am looking for in an investment. And they clearly have my best interest in mind. How do you fall for that? She is exactly like the evil queen, isn't she? So that is totally Bitcoin. And and notice how uh, the, the evil queen says that she's, she's going to make Peter a prince of Narnia. He already is a king of Narnia, you know? So she is uh, deceiving him. She's saying, uh, you know, your um, your power comes from me because I am going to make you a prince of Narnia. When in reality, um, Peter already is a king of Narnia, and that's just what uh, that's just what con artists do. They say, uh, uh, "We, you know, we know, we know everything. We know what we're doing. So uh, you just let us handle everything." Okay. So now I'm going to do some examples. And, you know, we're going to think about what kind of monsters people are, okay? So I'm going to start with uh, Vitalik Buterin, okay? What kind of monster is he? Well, I would say that Vitalik is a funny monster. I mean, look at him. A uh, funny monster. Some kind of uh, dwarf, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like dwarves because dwarves dig deep. And to me, that means they go deep into the mind, they are searching for uh, the great idea. Okay, that's a dwarf. And I really like the dwarves in the Lord of the Rings movies because they are, um, they kind of have a geometry theme. They're like, they're like mathematicians. Okay, so that's what Vitalik is like. He's like a tinkerer. He thinks about math ideas and he's searching for the great idea. But actually, come to think of it, that is not what he's like at all. I actually think, well he, well, he is a funny monster, but I think he's more like a leprechaun. Yeah, he is a leprechaun because he says, 
follow me to the end of the rainbow, which is totally a real place, and I will show you my pot of gold. Okay? Uh, next guy, uh, Mercia Popescu. Okay, um, well, this guy is also funny, but you don't, it's not because you're laughing at him, okay? You want to, you hope to be laughing with him, because otherwise he is laughing at your misery, okay? So he is a scary monster, definitely a scary monster who, who would, uh, crunch your bones, but sing a song and dance about it first, okay? So I think that he is like the Goblin King from The Hobbit. Yes, he is totally like the Goblin King, uh, because he has a bunch of little goblins all around him. So whenever he goes, uh, <laughs> they all go, uh, <laughs> Am I right? That's him. Totally him. Everything in Bitcoin will make so much more sense once you start to do this. Trust me. So next guy, I'm going to do uh, Richard Hart, the uh, the YouTube guy. So I found a perfect character for him in the book that I have been uh, reading recently, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is book three of the Narnia series. Okay, so I think that he is like Reepy Cheep, the Mouse Warrior, and I think that because uh, he is always uh, dressed nice, he wants to be very striking, and uh, Reepy Cheep has a sword. He's a fighter, and Richard Hart likes to fight, and um, he is like a servant. Okay, because he serves. Blockstream and uh, Reepy Cheap is a uh, he is a servant too because when when you become when you go into Narnia and you become a king of Narnia all of the little animals are your slaves so that's that's what Reepy Cheap is like and that's kind of what I think uh, Richard Hart is like and I'm gonna read uh, how Reepy Cheap is introduced in uh, in the book just to uh, give you more of a sense of this character. You might call it, and indeed it was, a mouse. But then it was a mouse on its hind legs, and it stood about two feet high. A thin band of gold passed round its head, under one ear and over the other, and in this was struck a long crimson feather, as the mouse's fur was very dark, almost black. The effect was bold and striking totally him. Its left paw rested on the hilt of a sword, very nearly as long as its tail. Its balance, as it paced gravely along the swaying deck, was perfect, and its manners courtly. That's him. Lucy and Edmund recognized it at once. Reby Cheep, the most valiant of all the talking beasts of Narnia, and the chief mouse. It had won undying glory in the second battle of Beruna, Lucy longed, as she had always done, to take Reepy Cheep up in her arms and cuddle him. But this, as she well knew, was a, ple uh, was a pleasure she could never have. It would have offended him deeply. Instead, she went down on one knee to talk to him. Reepy Cheep put forward his left leg, drew back his right, bowed, kissed her hand, straightened himself, twirled his whiskers, and said in his shrill, piping voice, My humble duty to your majesty, and to King Edmund, too. Here he bowed again. Nothing except your majesty's presence was lacking in this glorious venture. Uh, totally him. So now we're going to skip ahead to book four, The Silver Chair. There's a fantastic sequence in book four where the main characters are searching for a missing prince of Narnia. And uh, they go deep under the earth into the, uh, the underground kingdom. And they meet the evil queen again. Uh, and it turns out this is a totally different evil queen from in the first book. But they're uh, exactly the same. And this is the kind of person C.S. Lewis is. He, uh, he killed off the evil queen in book one, but he could not kill off the evil queen in his mind. So he uh, made another character exactly like her. It is, it is evil queen number two. These guys are like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, but anyway... This queen has a servant, and he wears a mask. And he says, uh, the queen has given me everything. I owe her 
everything. I will do whatever she wants. Um, and the queen says, this man has a madness. Uh, every month, we have to tie him up. Because that's when he goes mad. It's, I think it's every month. Something like that. It's like a full moon thing or something. And we have to tie him up. Or he attacks. Or he gets violent. The mad, That's when the madness comes out. So then... Uh, they when When he gets tied up... He starts to talk like a different person. And he says... Uh, he says, I'm really the Prince of Narnia that you're looking for. Why don't you let me out? You know, why don't you let me be myself again? Because he's really, the madness is every time that's not the full moon in reality. Really, on the full moon, he remembers who he is. And he wears a mask because his original identity has been hidden. Um, and the mask shows that he has adopted the uh the cult personality the uh the um the mass produced personality in the cult that's that's who he was and he forgot that he is a prince of narnia and the children don't know they don't know who he really is is he the prince or is he a deceiver um, so that is what happens when you eat the Turkish delight. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a, a story where I lost perspective. Okay, so I forgot that I was a king of Narnia in, in this story. So I'm going to tell you about my friend Skepa Fox. He's from the furry fandom. He's got some Bitcoin, but he's not in the madness. He doesn't, he doesn't follow things that closely. Um, so he he asked me about Bitcoin Cash when when it was coming out. He said, "What do you you know? What do you think I should do about these forks? You know, do, do you think I should just um, you know, uh, do nothing? Do you think I should just stay diversified and just kind of see see what happens and may, maybe put a little bit on one side if I I start to see that that one is winning?" And I said something very embarrassing back to him. I said, "Wow." Did you really think of that yourself? Because I had been so used to arguing with people in Bitcoin and saying saying that exact thing to people in Bitcoin and having them respond with things like, no, we must protect the block stream. And, and I, had ki I had forgot that what I was saying was obvious. Okay? Um... And my friend Skepa Fox reminded me, and uh, oh, and of course, uh, well, I want to say he, I think he's very smart and he has great ideas. But in this case, I realized he was just saying something obvious because he hadn't put much thought into this. This was just the first thing that occurred to him, and he was just asking me if it sounded okay. And I was like, "Wow, that's amazing that you thought of that." Okay, so that's that's what happens if you spend too much time in Narnia. So every religious story has really obvious questions that completely unravel the entire thing. Like, why did God put the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden in the first place? Okay, The reason is, if you're in the cult, you have to avoid thinking the obvious thing. Okay, So if you're in a cult, it's very easy to accidentally remember that you're a king of Narnia. Okay, it's very easy to accidentally notice that it is all crazy, and then you leave, and then they don't have you as a member anymore. So that there is always a tree of knowledge nearby that you have to be trained to fear and actively avoid. Okay, and that that is the obvious thing. That is the thing that they want to stop you from thinking. So here is a monster who is a combination. Stormtrooper, Orc, and Redshirt, who seems to believe that he exists for his investments rather than the other way around. And he believes that he needs to take on extra risk for his own investments, which is what he's saying, because that's what it means to fight on the front lines, right? Instead of selling, which is what you should do. If your investment gets too risky, 
you should sell. And that is quite an obvious thing for him to forget. So I think that this person has had a lot of Turkish delight. Now, quick investment advice. If your followers are willing to take on extra risk for you, that means you're not going to have a lot of followers eventually. Because what happens on the front lines? Okay, so we're going to continue where we left off on book one. And uh, basically, um, in, in book one, uh, Santa Claus gives the children weapons and they attack the evil queen and she pretty much knuckles under immediately. Um, it's like she has nothing. She's just bluffing, you know. And uh, then, uh, so idiot boy gets saved and then the children become kings of Narnia. Uh, in the sense that they actually rule Narnia. So all of the, the animals, all of the talking animals become their slaves. And uh, they are like royalty. And they forget that they are children. Because they forget. They forget the wardrobe. They, f they think that they are just the rulers of Narnia. And they forget that they have an identity outside. And at the end of the book... They, f they find the wardrobe again and they remember and they say, wow, you know, we've been rulers of Narnia and now we're children again. Isn't that interesting? Kind of just like the cult member in book four. Um, what do you think that means? Well, I'll tell you what it means. When you're in a religion, the, the presentation of evil that they give you is really a depiction of themselves okay so the religion shows you itself when it shows you evil and uh, the reason is when you are in a religion they make you they want you to forget the outside okay they want to block off knowledge of the outside so people in the religion do not really know what the outside looks like so when they show you when they show you evil evil is the outside Okay, because anything anything that's not of the religion is evil, according to them, right? So when they show you what they think evil looks like, they just show you a a, a themselves, and that's because all that's all they know. They only know themselves. They don't they don't actually know what the outside looks like. So C.S. Lewis, he's in a cult. He's in Christianity, and he shows us. The cult member. Um, and then the children are like the cult members, too. The only difference is that instead of an evil queen, they have Santa Claus. Because he gives them weapons. She gives them Turkish delight. You know? I think you've had a little too much Turkish delight, C.S. Lewis. Okay, that's what it's like being in a cult. Your, your, your power is taken away, and... Any power that you have comes from other people. So next I'm going to tell you about a sequence from book three, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And this was kind of a formative moment for me when I read them in fourth grade. So what we learn in Voyage of the Dawn Treader is that when you go into Narnia, you can turn into a monster. Um, and this happens to a character called Eustace, who is kind of like a snotty, bratty character and he finds a magic artifact that turns him into a dragon. And then this represents his sin. So we're seeing his, what he looks like on the inside, on the outside. So he is saying, you know, how, how will I ever turn back into a boy? And the other characters are like, you know, what are we going to do with poor Eustace? And all the time I'm reading this, I'm thinking like, what is wrong with you, idiot boy? That is obviously an improvement. I mean, are you kidding me? What kid would not want to be a dragon? And I was reading this and I was like, wh why isn't he even thinking about how cool this is? And there's a part where he has to uh, fly around the island and he hunts game to, you know, to stockpile food for the characters. And it's like, uh, you're unhappy by this? I mean, cry me a river, kid. You're saying... <laughs> That you spread your leathery wings and you flew around the island and you hunted game 
with your giant fangs and claws. I am not sympathetic, but he is like such a horrible character. He is so... Why doesn't he want to be a dragon? So it felt like I was having this argument with C.S. Lewis. I was like, why doesn't... Why doesn't he want to be a dragon? Of course he would want to be a dragon. He's like, oh, no, uh, no, you don't want to be a dragon. Well, why not? That's obviously an improvement. Oh, no, you don't want to be a dragon. That's sin. Well, I don't care what it is. I want to be a dragon. That's great. <laughs> no, you don't want to be a dragon. Yes, I do want to be a dragon, C.S. Lewis, your stupid fantasy author. <laughs> he says, uh, well, you can't be a king of Narnia if you become a dragon. Well, why not? What, are you racist? There is no logical reason why a dragon could not also be a king of Narnia. Hmm. I think you might be the evil queen, C.S. Lewis. I think you're offering me Turkish delight. Because you're saying, you know, well, what do I get? What do I get as king of Narnia? And he says, well, Santa Claus gives you weapons and all of the talking animals obey you. Hmm. Pretty sure I could accomplish that as a dragon. I mean, you're telling me that Santa Claus giving me weapons is better than having giant claws on my own hands. It's agency. C.S. Lewis is saying he doesn't want you to have agency. Okay, Santa Claus has agency. You don't have agency. That's what it's like when you're in a cult. Your power comes from other people, not from you. And if you wanted to be a dragon, that would mean your power comes from you. Okay, so they don't want that. But you can't think about it because that's the obvious thing. And if you did, the story would unravel. And I felt the same way when uh, I would have arguments with people in Bitcoin about SegWit. Okay, because... Uh, people would say to me, like, well, if you don't like SegWit, you don't have to upgrade the software. And I was like, well, why would I, why the, what the fuck does that do? That doesn't do anything. I would, I would want to actually change things in some way. Why can't I take an investment action that makes one side more risky? Okay, that affects the outcome. And they're like, oh, you know, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, I do want to do that. No, you know, you're, you're just a kid. You know, you're not a dragon. Yes, I am a dragon. I am a dragon. I am definitely a dragon. It's like, no, you want, you want to follow the team. The team knows what they're doing. No, I am definitely a dragon. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paradise Lost. Because Paradise Lost, that's a Protestant book. So that's a source for C.S. Lewis. That, that's kind of, kind of what he believed. And that'll give you some, some context. So I'm going to quickly go over Paradise Lost. And uh, so, so in, in C.S. Lewis, when he shows you evil, he shows you a cult member. So he is someone who was totally, um, totally crushed by the mind control. Whereas John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, uh, he, when he shows you evil in the character of Satan, he shows you uh, the man that he could have been. He shows you like a, the great man who was not totally suppressed by the uh, the mind control. So he still has some spirit left, and that's what he shows you when he depicts evil. Um, what's his face? William Blake. William Blake said that John Milton is really in Satan's camp. So he, what he was saying is there is a hidden message in Paradise Lost, which is really you're supposed to follow Satan. Um, but I, I actually think that it's, it's really Poe's law. It's really like, uh, John Milton, uh, shows us, um, something that was so obviously evil to people around him that he just forgot to give him any actual bad qualities. So he, he gives Satan agency. Okay, Satan is the main character, and the story revolves around him in Paradise Lost. And then John Milton is thinking, uh, yeah, you know, people will know that that's evil because anybody who acts like they're a main character is evil. And that's what it's like being a Puritan. You know, you look around and you're like, oh my god, that guy's not acting like a robot. It must be Satan! Ah, buttons! You know, that's Puritans. Okay? So, Milton 
shows us something that uh, a, a good Puritan would obviously think is evil, but he forgot to give it any actual bad quality. So that's Paradise Lost. Uh, so uh, here is the plot really quickly. Um, first, Satan builds pandemonium, which is a big pile of gold that they make into a building, and that's going to be that's going to be the demon parliament. Um, and this is the kind of thing that uh, that John Milton has Satan do that's evil. He sits on a big pile of gold, which is, you know, tacky maybe, but uh, you know, I've heard worse. So then there's a part that I really like because Satan goes around and he has to recognize the other demons. Okay, because they all just landed in hell and they have all been turned into monsters. Okay, so they, they don't recognize each other anymore. They, they used to see each other as angels. Now they're seeing the monster form. And it, I think that that's really dramatic. So it goes around and does that for a while. And eventually he meets sin and death. And these are his children. Sin is his daughter, and death is his son. So Sin is the guard. She has the key to the gates of hell. And Satan wants her to let him out. So he says, I come no enemy, but to set free from out this dark and dismal house of pain both him and thee. So Sin and Death. And all the heavenly host of spirits that in our just pretenses armed fell with us from on high. From them I go, this uncouth errant soul, and one for all myself expose, with lonely steps to tread the unfounded deep. So he's saying he's going out by himself, taking risk for the other demons, which is the opposite of what happens with Blockstream, you know, ser searching for something good for his demons. Okay, so Satan is a good leader, unlike Blockstream, because he's the one taking risk and he leaves the demons safely in hell, okay? And Satan uh, has heard of Earth, but he's never seen it because it was being created uh, while he was falling. So first there's the war in heaven, then Satan starts falling, then God creates the Earth, and sin Satan lands in hell. Uh, so he says, um, Lonely steps to tread the unfounded deep, and through the void immense to search, with wandering quest, a place foretold should be, and by concurring signs ere now created vast and round, a place of bliss in the purliest of heaven, and therein placed a race of upstart creatures, to supply, perhaps, our vacant room, though more removed, lest heaven, surcharged with potent multitude, potent multitude, sorry, might hap to move new broils. Be this, or aught than this, more secret, now designed, I haste to know, and this once known, shall soon return. So he's saying, uh, I'm open to new information. Okay, I've got a plan, but I am open to new information. So Satan is great. I love Satan. Um, and this once known shall soon return and bring ye to the place where thou and death shall dwell at ease and up and down unseen with wing silently the buxom air embalmed with odors there ye shall be fed and filled, filled immeasurably. All things shall be your prey. He ceased, for both seemed highly pleased, and death grinned a horrible, ghastly smile to hear his famine should be filled, and blessed his maw destined to that good hour. So I like death a lot because death is like a, is like a, an insatiable famine, and that's just like me because I have an insatiable famine to be rich. Uh, so then um, Sin starts talking and she says, the key of this infernal pit by do and by command of heaven's all-powerful king, I keep by him forbidden to unlock these adamantian gates. Against all force, death ready stands to interpose his dart, fearless to be o'ermatched by living might. So she's saying, I'm the only one standing between you and the outside. Uh, but And I am charged with keeping the door shut. But then, then she says, uh, But what owe I to his commands above, who hates me, and hath hither thrust me down into this gloom of Tartarus profound, to sit in hateful office here confined, inhabitant of heaven, and heavenly born, here in perpetual agony and pain, with terrors and with clamors compassed round of mine own brood that on my bowels feed? 
Thou art my father, thou, thou my author, thou uh, my being gave me. Whom should I obey but thee? Whom follow? Thou wilt bring me soon to that new world of light and bliss, among the gods who live at ease, where I shall reign at thy right hand voluptuous, as beseems thy daughter and thy darling, without end. So how fucking logical? You couldn't get more logical than that. Great arguments there, Sin. She basically says, uh, well, God's being a jerk... And you are my real father, so you're more likely to have my best interest in mind. Could you possibly have a better argument in there? Okay, this is this is religious thinking. Okay, religious people are like, we'll name a character Sin and say she's ugly and scary, and then have her say everything we don't want people to think. So if you're a Puritan, and you see somebody who says, uh, well, I think that I will follow my real father rather than the official religion, because he's more likely to have my best interest in mind. They're like, ah, sin, sin. Ah. And if somebody says, um, you know, uh, the official religion is being a jerk, so I think I'll follow my own interest instead of theirs, then people think, uh, ah, sin, ah, sin. Ah. Okay, so anyway, uh, so sin opens the gates of death. Uh, it says, um, uh, and I really like this part. It says, thus saying, from her side the fatal key, sad instrument of all our woe, she took, and towards the gate, rolling her bestial train, forthwith the huge portcullis high up drew, which but herself not all the Stygian powers could once have moved. Then in the keyhole turns the intricate wards, and every bolt and bar of massy iron or solid rock with ease unfastens. On a sudden open fly, with impetuous recoil and jarring sound, the infernal doors, and on their hinges great, harsh thunder, that the lowest bottom shook of Erebus. She opened, but to shut, excelled her power, the gates wide, open stood, that with extended wings a bannered host under spread ensigns marching might pass through with horse and chariots ranked in loose away, uh, array. So, yes, yeah, she opens the doors, but she can't close them again. So wide they stood, and like a furnace mouth cast forth redounding smoke and ruddy flame. Before their eyes in sudden view appear the secrets of the hoary deep, a dark, illimitable ocean without bound, without dimension, where length, breadth, and height, and time, and place are lost with the eldest night and chaos ancestors of nature hold eternal anarchy amidst the noise of endless wars and by confusion stand so uh there's uh there's a sea of of chaos out there and it's totally awesome it's totally like my kind of place because i'm a big fan of chaos if you're gonna tell me like yeah we don't have uh, we don't have length breadth, and height anymore in there and time is gone i'm like oh i am there let me in this is kind of how i feel when i have arguments about uh, you know, investors controlling things. Because to somebody who is wedded on one chain of Bitcoin, uh, I am showing them chaos. I am bringing them closer to chaos. They're scared of chaos because if you're not diversified, then, you know, the, the war between all the chains is, is crazy and scary. It's chaotic. Okay, but if you're diversified like me, then you can say, uh, more chaos, bring on the chaos, come on, let's, let's have more chaos, okay? Um, and that's, that scares people. So that's kind of how I feel when I read this book, is you're talking about something as if it's scary, but it really is not. Um, so the gates open, and death is unleashed into the world. And, uh, to me, this is kind of like what I'm doing to somebody in the Blockstream cult. Because I'm saying, like, if the developers don't continue to uh, provide value for the investors, then they should become unimportant because their chain should lose value and go to zero. Okay, so I am opening the gates of hell and letting death into the world. Okay, just like Satan. But remember, remember my conversation with Skepafox. Remember, he was like, well, isn't it obvious? Yes, I am saying something obvious. But to somebody in the Blockstream cult, it is like I am opening the gates of hell. Okay? Um, 
So then uh, Satan crosses the Sea of Chaos to find Earth. And uh, that is something, I, I mean, I think that Bitcoin is going to be heading towards the Sea of Chaos pretty soon. So a good leader in Bitcoin would be someone who can cross the Sea of Chaos, uh, like Satan. Uh, but I don't think that uh, the, uh, the Blockstream people are prepared to cross the Sea of Chaos. So uh, then lots of nothing happens, and uh, you're... I swear this is true. This really happens in the book. An angel comes down from heaven to see Adam, you know, the perfect man, and the angel teaches him about science. And there's a part where Adam says, uh, does the sun uh, revolve around the earth, or does the earth revolve around the sun? And the angel is like, gee... Because that was a scientific question of the day when uh, John Milton wrote this. The angel says, uh, gee, that sounds like one of those questions that uh, humans aren't supposed to know. I mean, do you think when you're, maybe you're tampering in God's domain there? I think you should stop asking questions like that. I'm serious. That's what happens in the book. And Adam says, uh, uh, yes, I am a good human, so I will stop uh, questioning into God's domain. And so, so they're modeling good behavior for a cult member where all knowledge comes from on high and the uh, the leaders tell you what to think and you know they get to tell you whether to ask a question or not uh, so then um, Satan uh, tries to tempt Eve to eat the fruit and there's just a little line here that I thought was um, interesting uh, it says uh, he leading swiftly rolled in tangles and made intricate seem straight. And I thought that was really interesting because when I thought about my conversation with Skepafox, remember he says, isn't it obvious? Okay, so uh, if you go outside the cult, so or if you're inside the Blockstream cult, the idea of the investors control things and you just stay diversified and you only you only buy one chain or the other when you want to take a risk, that is intricate. That is an intricate idea. Uh, but when you are outside, it is the obvious idea. So Satan made intricate seem straight as a snake. He's disguised as a snake now. Oh, by the way, this is another supposedly sinful thing that Satan does. Is he disguises himself as a snake, but I don't think that's bad either because Bitcoin is a big poker game. So everybody needs to play with the cards close to their hands. So putting on a disguise, I don't think that that's so bad. Now Satan tries to con convince Eve to eat the fruit, and he says, O oh, sacred, wise, and wisdom-loving plant, mother of science, now I feel thy power within me clear, not only to discern things in their causes, but to trace the ways of highest agents, deemed however wise. Sounds like he's talking about a prediction market to me. Queen of this universe, he's talking to Eve, remember? Do not believe those rigid threats of death. Ye shall not die. How should you? By the fruit, it gives life to your knowledge. By the threatener, look on me. Me, who have touched and tasted, yet both live. And life, more perfect, have attained. than fate meant me by venturing higher than my lot. Now, of course, I disagree with that part, because obviously I would not ever think that eating from the tree of knowledge was higher than my lot. Um, shall that be shut to man, which to beast is open? So he's saying, I'm the snake, so I ate the fruit, so why don't you eat the fruit? Because you're the higher being, you know? Uh, or will God incense his ire for such a petty trespass, and not praise, rather, your dauntless virtue, from uh, whom the pain of death denounced, whatever thing death be, deterred not from achieving what might lead to happier life, knowledge of good and evil, of good how just, of evil, if what is evil be real, why not known, since easier shunned. Great argument there from Satan. He's saying, if you know what evil is, you can avoid it. And that is true, because if you're diversified, then you don't have to care about the conflict, okay? So, like, when I let death into the world, when I open the gates of hell and let death into the world, you can avoid it 
if you understand it. You see, you just have to be diversified and then you are not in the conflict, okay? So death only comes to people who take risk by choosing one chain over the other. And otherwise, you just stay in the Garden of Eden and you're fine, okay? God, therefore, cannot hurt ye and be just. Not just, not God, not feared then, nor obeyed. Your fear itself of death removes the fear. Why, then, was this forbid? Why, but to awe? Why, but to keep ye low and ignorant, his worshippers? He knows that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes that seem so clear, yet are but dim, shall perfectly be then opened and cleared, and ye shall be as gods. Because you'll realize that the sensible thing to do is to diversify and let them deal with the conflict. Okay? And then you don't have to leave the Garden of Eden. And what are gods that man may not become as they, participating godlike food? The gods are first, and that advantage use on our belief that all from them proceeds. I question it. For this fair earth I see, warmed by the sun, producing every kind, them nothing. If they all things who enclose knowledge of good and evil in this tree, that whoso eats thereof forthwith attains wisdom without their leave. So Satan is saying the investors really are the creators, okay? Because they make things have value, okay? And wherein lies the offense that man should thus attain to know? What can your knowledge hurt him, or this tree impart against his will, if all be his? Or is it envy? And can envy dwell in heavenly breasts? These, then, and many more causes, import your need of this fair fruit. Goddess humane, reach then, and freely taste. Well, Satan, you had me at mother of science, okay? You didn't really have to go any further than that. So then, basically, Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Well, first Eve eats it, and then she's like, Ah, what have I done? And then Adam says, uh, Oh, no, what have you done? I love you more than God. Ah, nah, nah, nah. So, uh, and then they get thrown out of the garden because they don't, they don't and understand investment strategy correctly. So that's, that's Satan, and the, he didn't do anything wrong. See, he destroyed God's plan, but all he had to do was suggest a different plan. Okay, he, he just said, isn't knowledge better than ignorance? Okay, pretty shitty plan if all you have to do to ruin it is suggest another plan, right? What is, what is, what is wrong with Satan? Pride? Pride isn't that bad. Pride just means, uh, you know, you say that there's another being in the universe more powerful than me? Come on. That's just pride. That's not so bad. Uh, and pride is what every branch of Bitcoin should feel. Okay? Uh, he is not selling Turkish delight. He is selling agency. Okay? So John Milton uh, still knew what agency was. And he still could imagine a great man who has agency. But he had to put this man in the character of Satan uh, to trick people into to not noticing and and himself. So uh, there uh, in the uh, the original story, there are strings attached to being in the Garden of Eden because God does throw people out, right? And the string is you have to be dumb. Um, you know that's just like saying. You can't be a dragon because, you know, you have Santa Claus. Um, no, that's not good enough. So back to Narnia. Um, how does idiot boy Eustace turn back into a kid? Uh, this sequence is absolutely dreadful. So what happens is, in a dream, Aslan, the lion who represents Jesus shows up and Eustace takes his skin off. Okay? He takes the dragon skin off and there is a boy underneath. And here is the really terrifying part. He looks at himself and he says, 
there's still some scales left. I'd better take my skin off again. So he has to take another layer of skin off. And then, then he doesn't see any scales anymore. And this is just how all religions are. They always do this. They say they promise everything. And then if, if, if it doesn't work, it's your fault. So you're like, well, I took my skin off ten times today and I still haven't achieved enlightenment. They're like, well, you're going to have to do it some more. That, what, what they're saying, so what C.S. Lewis is saying is you have to take, everybody has a little bit of Satan in them and you have to take it off. You have to remove your real personality and uh, until you're just nothing left. You're just a child. So this is just like how the cult member in book four puts on the mask and his real personality is erased. Well, it's it's hidden. But in Eustace, when he removes his dragon skin, it's, it's like it's erased because that's what the religion wants. Um, they want to erase your original personality so that all that's left is the cult personality. So, uh, this is why Narnia is kind of an unpleasant fantasy. So that's what makes it good as a way of thinking about the Bitcoin world, in my opinion. So when you go into Bitcoin, you imagine that you're in Narnia and you don't want to forget who you really are or you become mind controlled and you want to bring reality in with you. Okay. And I discovered something new about this recently, which I'm going to explain now. So before I was talking about imagining other people as monsters and that's creative because you say what they are in your mind. But if you are the person who is not in the fantasy and everybody else is in the fantasy, you can do more than just imagining them as monsters. They will let you tell them what kind of monster you are. And that's what I learned recently. So when I started my YouTube series, my intention was to play a character called the investor and the investor is the owner of Bitcoin and he just runs around and he acts like he owns the place and he treats everybody like an inferior and he is kind of uh, flippant with people and he says ah, yeah, I don't have time for you and he likes to uh, make people scared a little bit because he makes jokes he says uh, you know hey I'm God ah, smash stuff yeah you know and uh, I didn't think that anybody was really going to pay much attention to this because uh, it, it just seems so silly to me. I just wanted an outlet. You know, I wanted to blow off some steam because I was sick of how things had been going lately. You know, so I wanted I was annoyed. So, uh, you know, so I did that. But the uh, investor got more attention than I was expecting. Uh, and just imagine, just imagine you're walking around outside and you do this. You go, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, whoa, what was that? And you say, what are you talking about? I just went like this. I just went, blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, my God. That was amazing. Do it again. What are you talking about? You mean just this? Just blah, blah, blah. Whoa, okay. That's enough. That's enough. That was great. And you're like, I, I, that's how I felt. I felt like I was just going like, like, blah, blah, blah. Because I was making like totally, totally ridiculous jokes and playing such a stupid character. Um, so, uh, I kind of felt like I was turning into a dragon, right? Because I was going like, uh, ah, and people were acting like they were quite impressed by this. Um, so, uh, so I thought, what is going on? And at first I was like, oh, I just want to go back to being a normal boy. Oh. But then I remembered uh, my uh, 
experience in fourth grade when I told myself that if I were ever to turn into a dragon, that uh, I would definitely have fun with it. Okay, so here's kind of what I think is happening. I am showing people reality. And remember how I said I had, you know, my furry friends outside, you know, and I tell them about what happens in Bitcoin, and they say, really? That's really happening? That sounds ridiculous. And that, you know, and I'm like, yes, it's, it's ridiculous. So then I can, I can bring that back in. And then I can show people reality. Because the reality is the investors are in charge, and... Uh, that's what my character is. He's, he's a joke about uh, investors being in charge. He doesn't even notice when you don't listen to him. So I remember once um, a furry friend of mine, he said, uh, who's crazier, Bitcoiners or furries? And I was like, well, obviously Bitcoiners. And he was like, really? And I said, yeah, the furries know that it's a fantasy. And he went like this. He went, oh... Because he was just imagining the furry fandom if people forgot that it was a fantasy. And glimpsing some of the madness of Bitcoin. So if you can bring reality in, you, you can do it with satire, right? Because everything in Bitcoin is ridiculous, so you use satire. Bring, bring satire in to show people reality. And um, so... You know, as I said, I kind of felt like like I was a monster when uh, when I started doing my videos. Because I could see that some people really were kind of scared, you know? And I, uh, it felt like I was exposing people's weak hands. Because people with weak hands are afraid of the investor. Because he says, uh, yeah, it's just smash everything, yeah, you know. Uh, and they can't afford that. <laughs> um, but So it, it separates people with weak hands from people with, uh, with strong hands. And I thought, wow, like that is really cool. Okay, so now I want to expose, I want to expose all the weak hands around here. So I want you to join me. Uh, and show me your monster impression, okay? So I want you to help expose weak hands by doing uh, a monster impression. So your monster, your monster laughs at fear, not in a mean way, but just like a ha 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 ha, you know, um, just to see who's afraid. You know, they're not ready for that. I bet you will get. I bet you will be surprised at your response, okay? So uh, when, when you play the monster, you can create reality, okay? If, if people are in a fantasy, you can create the reality by just, you know, playing, playing the character. So um, a dragon is a great monster, but it's kind of like a child monster, you know? So I want to be uh, an adult monster, right? Because the problem with being a dragon is that you you can't not be impressive, okay? Because you are always just big and amazing, right? Uh, but an adult monster chooses who to impress. So maybe this is somebody with no official position of authority who uh, seems to act ridiculous on a surface level. But that person could be the most powerful monster. So if you are someone who uh, is grounded in reality and who has a strong hand, which could mean that you have no bitcoins, or it could mean that you uh, have a lot, but you've just you're uh, you're confident in your strategy, then I'd like to see your monster impression, because only people with strong hands can do monster impressions. That's how we expose the weak hands. It's going to be just like in Paradise Lost, remember? Because we have to recognize each other. And the way we do it is if we laugh at each other's monster impression, then we are leaders, okay? Um, we are people who can cross the Sea of Chaos, and uh, so other 
people, you know, uh, need to follow us, okay? And people who act scared like this... What, what could be more poisonous and cancerous to a fucking censorship-resistant cryptocurrency fucking cyberpunk movement than a backroom signed fucking agreement by a bunch of people who have the consensus of jack shit? Miners? These motherfuckers aren't on Twitter. These motherfuckers are not on Reddit. These yeah. motherfuckers often don't speak English. Yeah. Do I want people I am incapable of communicating with, even though I'm a very talkative dude? I don't look like an idiot right now, but this is this is how his words make me feel inside. No two X guys. Gotta keep freedom alive. They are like little talking animals. Because here's the thing. If you are on a sinking ship and you are the only person acting like uh, you're not worried, no matter how ridiculous you are, people are going to be drawn to that. You know, they can see that you're someone who can cross the sea of chaos. Okay? And uh, so I think that today's monsters are going to be tomorrow's leaders. So show me your monster impression. And I want to see pandemonium.